Tim, we're back, 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 talking exercise selection today. A little late in the game, so I'm sure many people are wondering, why did we wait so long to get into exercise selection? Sure. No, I'm kidding. So I would come back and say that there's so much preliminary information we need to gather. And there's so much stuff that we need to know and understand. And so much stuff that we need to understand what we have control over and what we don't have control of. That's central as to why we choose to put exercise selection as the fifth podcast in this programming series, just to acknowledge the fact that if we don't know what the underlying problems are, what the goals are, what are our frequency, and then what are the training splits we're allowed to work with, and then the exercises we choose don't really matter, right? And that part, I think it's in terms of order operations or uh, the the just pure complexity that we can do our programming with, right? And we have to eventually get down to the other end of this of when we select our exercises, sets, reps, intensity, rest, time or attention, this intersection of variables and exercise selection, that there's going to be bottlenecks. And we look at the ability, we look at the knowledge, we look at the facility of the staff and, and how we can integrate with all that. You know, the exercise selection to me feels not trivial and not unimportant, but Definitely in terms of all hosts of things that we need to consider prior to, and then not only that after makes it warranted to be put as a fifth episode in this series, but it doesn't make it unimportant overall. It just means that we have to work through a lot of detail and, and just information to make sure that we're making the best decision possible. All right. So then we, we did all this preliminary test. We got all this data. What's, what's the decision tree as we go through exercise selection? Well, I mean, we got to face facts that eventually we're going to load these patterns redundantly, meaning we're going to do them multiple times per week, multiple times throughout the course of a mesocycle and a macrocycle. And then we're going to do it to threshold that we're going to push it to some sort of voluntary maximal effort that they're going to have to express the qualities of the biomotor abilities to their utmost level. And when we think about the exercises that we're going to do redundantly and we're going to push a threshold, we have to ask ourselves. Are there exercises that might be potentially limited if we were going to push to threshold redundantly? And that creates a central theme to our exercise selection. Now, we can't just simply just choose exercises without any kind of awareness that eventually this could be problematic or hit diminishing returns. That becomes a central theme is what we need to investigate with our information gathering. And I start to look at the biomechanical assessment, the physiological assessment, all the preliminary information to make sure that I'm choosing the exercise that I can push to threshold redundantly. And if I don't have an inventory of that, and I'm kind of shooting blind in the dark, and I don't necessarily have a really good idea that an exercise will react a certain way when I do it multiple times a week, a month, a year, and done to some sort of physical voluntary limit. And that's a problem. And that's a big problem because when we think about this, it's, it's sometimes conveyed in the option that we can get away with. We have a lot of latitudes when we're working one-on-one. Like if I was going to personal train you, Corey, and you were going to come to me and you're like, I don't really want to go through all this, this screening process and these tests to determine what exercise is quote unquote best or worse. I just want to train. I can pivot relatively quickly based off of seeing something that's not working right. And sometimes that gives us a little bit of a gravitas going into our group training program and think it's the same. It's a one-to-one exchange. It's not. We have certain levels that are going to be manifested out towards a larger group if we don't have this baseline preliminary information that is going to compound negatively, meaning that we're going to have multiple people doing things incorrectly or doing things that are potentially contraindicated. And those multiple people have a a negative impact on those around them. And then the standard becomes somewhat lower, the ceiling drops, and all of a sudden we have a program that doesn't produce as much results as we'd like, as well as potentially puts people in harm's way. And having an inventory of, am I working with you one-on-one and am I going to have a lot of latitude in that, in that it actually boots in the ground, executing on the plan that I can see very quickly, this is going to be square peg round hole and I can pivot, or am I going to be in a group dynamic where if I don't really focus on what's the best exercise. And there's another way to do that. It's programming to the lowest common denominator. Like who's going to be the worst in the room and programming around that. And there's no right or wrong here, but I would say if we're trying to optimize that experience and try to get the best performance with the least risk possible, having that information on the front end to choose exercises, that's got to be at least in the conversation, if not 
could just skip the first four steps and just go right into just throwing exercises on a sheet and with certain arbitrary sets, reps, intensity, time, and attention, and just going to work. So, I mean, it's just pretty obvious here. We're not saying like you have to squat, you have to do, or you have to back squat. Like we're going to focus on patterns. How do you make sure you're getting enough of like in different vectors with different implements, all that? Yeah. Well, I mean, create rules. That's one of the big things I talk about a lot is having some sort of list of rule to hold you accountable or hold you to a standard. And a very simple one is whatever you push, you pull. So that creates this dichotomy of movement that you start to break down of, okay, well, if I'm pressing something, I'm about to eventually pull it. And that could go into, I'm doing chest and back. I can go into quads and hamstrings. Like that's, if you have no experience with traditional pattern-based training of a squat, hinge, push, and pull, then you start to think about it. Well, how would I explain this to a layman? How would I explain this to a two-year-old? How would I explain this to someone just getting started? It's like, well, we're going to work chest, back, quads, and hamstrings. And what that does is gets these big global movers, quad, hamstrings, pecs, and lats to get stronger and for to develop a, maybe a cascade effect into these more distal muscle groups like forearms, calves, and, and maybe we get a better overall systemic effect. And then we can get this other element of those movement patterns can be further broken down into a vertical horizontal of the upper body. So whatever I push or pull can done in this up and down or forward and back, uh, depending on my orientation, my body. So if I'm on my back, I'm still pressing horizontally. It just happens to be go up and down because that's where the resistance curve is to gravity. And then I look at it from a lower body, you know, traditionally that's broken up a little bit differently and posterior chain, you have hip and knee dominant. So if I'm doing hip ridge or some sort of knee dominant leg curl. And if I'm looking at a squat pattern, it's less hip dominant, which you could argue of like, Hey, hip flexion is the same thing as knee flexion in some regards. So if we're working more of the proximal or the distal tissues of the quads or hamstrings, but traditionally when we're looking at a lower body push, it's broken up into a bilateral or unilateral. And then we could further break that down between all upper and lower. And we look at all this stuff can be done bilaterally or unilaterally just happens to be the way we kind of like, I guess focus our distribution of patterns or our allocating a stress towards muscle groups is broken up into the upper body horizontal push and pull or horizontal and vertical push and pull. And then we look at lower body, hip dominant, knee dominant, posterior chain, or this anterior chain of chain of trying to factor over a knee dominant or a knee dominant lower body bilateral unilateral push. And as we break down this and we start to think about those rules and how we're starting to hold ourselves accountable. You know, we simply just say like, all right, if I push it, I got to pull it. Like that's a pretty simple way to break it down. But then we start to look at it from maybe we need to have a multi-vector, multi-planar approach, right? So there's three cardinal planes, sagittal, transverse, and frontal. There's three primary vectors, vertical, horizontal, and rotational. They kind of overlap a lot. But what you traditionally see though, is a lot of this bases off of resistance to gravity. So if a barbell is being used and it's going to be resisted greatest when it's perpendicular to gravity. If we're using a dumbbell, same thing. Anything that we drop, it'll fall to the ground. We'll probably have some sort of resistance based off of where it is perpendicular to gravity. So we look at it from most of our lower body, upper body pushes and pulls are going to be this horizontal or vertical orientation to try to re have resistance based off of gravity, which gives some sort of inclination. If we want to really work horizontal, we want to really work transverse or rotational. They would probably get to at least include something in terms of a cable column, some pneumatic resistance, or even flywheel or conical based resistance. But all that being said is now we can start to create more criteria. So if I push and pull it, whatever I do in the sagittal, I got to think about having some sort of variation in the frontal or the transverse or whatever I do in the vertical, I got to think about some sort of orientation of the horizontal and the, that, and just to completely frank, without getting like very physics-y or engineering. If you're going to do some sort of vertical overhead press, you should do some sort of flat press. Like that, that is the way you look at orientation of vectors. I mean, instead of changing the resistance, we're changing the body's angle relative to speak into it. If I'm going to do some sort of, some sort of split squat, I should think about doing a lateral squat or a rotational posterior lateral squat of some nature. Uh, there's, there's uh, forces that are going to directly be aligned. So if I'm doing an RDL, then the forces are going to be more vertical, but if I'm going to do a single leg RDL with a contralateral resistance, meaning I'm holding a dumbbell opposite of my stance leg, there's some sort of anti-rotational effect or counter 
to that rotational vector, which is loading that vector eccentrically into that plane. There's a lot of that. But then there's another rule of, okay, well, if I was going to do this to threshold redundantly, what would be the problem? And if I can figure out a way to remove the bottleneck, whether there's going to be a lowered ceiling or potentially a higher risk of injury, should I at least inventory that? And that's why I make rules like I find asymmetry on my either fourth plate analysis or my movement assessment, I'm going to default to doing unilateral push and pull and just that's it. Right. And I always get the, well, you know, what if like, yeah, but I'm playing law of averages here. Cause I work with large groups. I got 600 clients coming to my gym every single day. I need to play a larger, a larger game here in terms of if we were going to distill out that singular anecdote of one person not getting hurt and then the other person getting hurt and that fractals out to now 300 of my 600 getting hurt, I have to play to the side of the person potentially getting hurt. And that applies to the team setting, that applies to work in the high school setting, the college, the pro, that we have to create these rules that are logical, intuitive, and agreed upon to select the best exercises overall. And then getting away or detaching from, well, if it's not going well, I can just pivot quickly. You probably can't to the degree that you want when you have multiple coaches and multiple athletes working at a given time. Relatively speaking, you working one on one, and you can pivot to something a lot, a lot better or a lot more specific and aligned with what we're trying to accomplish on that given day. Relatively speaking, to a goal. So thinking about that, of rules need to govern groups, rules need to govern decision making. There's two things to manage: there's group size, and then length, right? So there's a time variant and a quantity variant that we need to evaluate. We're selecting rules, and if I was going to look at this over time. Would that mistake be enough to be inhibitive to the results I want to get? We should create rules to limit that inhibition. Then we should look at it from a quantity perspective, but we could take that singular number and then aggregate that out to multiple people. Would it create some sort of inhibitive effect? So you can look at this as almost this like line that we have going up and down as X to the Y axis, and then the, the time over the X axis or vice versa. And then we think about that as terms of this is going to be the intersection of trying to do as much threshold without risk as possible and choosing rules to stay within that sweet spot. And that part becomes very interesting to me and having these, like what is true on a micro versus a macro scale becomes more and more important from that time versus, versus quantity variables and having really a good dialed in system to be successful over time because you shouldn't be surprised at the end of an end of a training phase that, oh, wow, this didn't really get what we wanted or man, that was, that was grossly what I did not expect. And that part to me has become more of a, I guess, afterthought that the outcome is, I think, unnecessarily expected, which I think we should still do our due diligence and focus on what is this from a systemic level, the problem I'm trying to work on versus the deals that the, or the problems I'm, I'm inheriting and trying to find solutions to fix them. And from an exercise selection standpoint, how we're taking this baseline information, it's seeing patterns and creating rules to pro solve that systemically over a longer period of time. So you covered a lot in terms of how to make sure, you know, everything's balanced, pushing, pulling in every vector. How do you go about distributing that in, you know, the various time slots that you've been given, whether it's two, three, four, et cetera? Yeah. So we talked about this last week in terms of our training split and we get into this, what is going to be your keystone piece? So typically it's that denoted as your primary exercise on that given day. And those primaries kind of set the, the training split. And we look at it from a three day total body or four day upper or lower, you know, the primary two ones we talked about a little bit about the five day body part split, uh, but as a whole, whatever that first exercise is on that given day is the foundational piece for the exercise selection in that given workout. And a lot of that is stemmed from the idea that a lot of these big movements, whether it's a four day total body, which breaks up really conveniently into that push, pull, hinge and squat sets the, the foundation off of that rotation. And then you look at it primarily that a one or that primary exercise gets a little bit more volume, a little bit more intensity because we're in this fresher. C CNS or muscular system state that we can tolerate more, but we typically see that becomes more of a point of emphasis that this is our big ROI period. If we're going to look at it from a Pareto principle that we're going to get 80% of the results from 20% of the things we do. So if we have 
a hundred exercises, then really only 20% of them are really going to make, make a difference. But with that being said is we look at those big four, we look at that same ratio if I'm going to do those four exercises that the other 12 exercises in that given training week are going to be maybe not as impactful to the bottom line. Uh, I think there's a danger in that logic that we typically see structural imbalance. We see some sort of myopic focus on certain exercises and certain things that are just based off a of bias or opinion and maybe even agenda. But we can also get into the, eventually we got to start settling on doing something. And we look at it from the end of, or the person's faster or stronger, or my kind of three big things of, can they run faster? Can they jump higher? Or can they project a med mile for, further? And then reverse engineering the process of that and saying, okay, well, where does a squat fit in? Where does a, a hinge fit in? Where does an upper body or upper body push or pull fit in? And then start to build the workout around it. And off of that, we start to see complementary things from a CNS loading perspective. So certain things just have a lower ceiling from a CNS loading. So if I was going to do a, like, say a back squat paired up with a, a deadlift, those would be two high systemic loads, which every once in a while, there might be a reason or rationale to do that, but there might be a case to be made about doing a alternating sequence of high threshold or high CNS impactful type movements with a high ceiling of, of external load paired up with something of the lower load. Uh, there might be an element of hitting different planes and vectors or for something that's extremely sagittal plane dominant and complement to that. There might be a case to be made about, all right, I'm going to organize this to really get the most from the next training session. So if I look at it from, let's say that I was going to do a three day total body lift and my B and C series have a ton of muscular damage that leads into that next day and inhibiting performance on that primary that we're supposed to squeeze out as much from that exercise or that movement pattern as possible. There's a, a there's an element of that. Then there's also an element of potentially focus and fatigue intersecting in those latter half. And do we need to pick exercises with cook or fail safe stuff that we actually physically have to hold like a dumbbell or med ball versus a barbell where we kind of get away with just managing that load somewhere in my, my back or my shoulder and grinding through reps and the residual or the negative consequence of that. And all that being said is that we have some sort of split that we work off a three day total body or four day upper lower talked a little bit about a push pull. We may even talked about a five day program, looking at body part splits. We built some sort of foundation of that workout of here's the target of that workout based off of the qualities I'm trying to develop, whether it's power, functional or relative strength, functional hypertrophy, hypertrophy or muscular endurance. And then I start to build in what exercises in that movement pattern would facilitate that quality. Then I start to say that exercise is going to be there. That's going to be the, the biggest distribution of time, effort, and energy throughout that course of the workout. And I start to build the exercises to complement that based off the other day. So I have structural balance and I also have really good quality from start to finish of that workout, hopefully facilitating a very predictable and high level of outcome with minimal risk. So I want to go back to that idea of like the 80, 20 rule and focusing on our, our big, our primaries, would you say that with that rule in mind, your primaries rotate, you know, you rotate your primaries a little less frequently and you rotate your other things a little more. How do you rotate through your exercises in terms of we're getting what we want. Should we stick with it until we don't, or when should we make that cutoff? There's soft rules in terms of novices need longer time with certain exercises than advanced because advanced need less time to get to maximal threshold load. Mm -hmm. So there's that. There's certain things in terms of this person's really fast switch. They're just going to burn out quick. If we don't have a high exercise rotation, just to be completely frank, some of the very high variation based methods are based off the of pharmaceutical enhanced programs. Like you just are, like if you think yeah. about West side or powerlifting that has a high degree of rotation of exercises, just, they're just incredibly adept, adept at responding to it based off of being on anabolic steroids. And that leads into their soft tissue, connective tissue is going to be at a compromised state because of all the stress we're putting on the muscular tissue, developing those big patterns. So having a high degree of variation matters quite a bit. Uh, but then there's another element of, you know, we want to go until we can't get any more from that exercise and just having an arbitrary, Hey, two weeks for advance and eight weeks for novice, or, uh, we're working incredibly high level of muscular endurance. So we typically see a burnout effect from two weeks of that. 
you know, or fast twitch muscle fiber athletes respond quicker, so they need shorter mesos. And and uh, and we look at slow twitch athletes need longer mesos. It could just be like, I can keep loading this. Like I, I still have room. I still have I still have a little bit of water left in the towel. And that's the metaphor we give our clients all the time: is the towel filled with water every week. You're wringing it out a little bit more, a little bit more. And by the end of the week, you want to squeeze it as hard as possible. That thing is almost dry as, as sandpaper. And when we get to that end of if you squeeze it as hard as you can on that last week, knowing that you gave your best effort from a technical standpoint, as well as from an effort standpoint on the previous three, then we've optimized and maximized that training block. If we wring the towel out week one and we got nothing left, you know, case could be made that progressive overload now is now out the window and we are not going to see any ad adaptive responses to that because we just simply just went too hard and we're not going to have any potential to look at the cause and effect relationship of doing an exercise with a certain set of variables and see what the impact residually over time is. But there is an element of, hey, in a certain setting, in a certain world, you might just have to land the plane, decide on, we're going to do a four week mezzo no matter what, or we're going to do two week accumulation block. And we're going to do four week intensification blocks might be, we're going to do a mixed method and we're going to hit some sort of quality on every given workout, whether it's power, relative strength, functional hypertrophy, hypertrophy, or muscular endurance, every single session, we might do a concurrent. We might do focus on a single day of that, but it gets down to how long can I progressively overload safely and effectively? And there could be an argument to be made about a 12 week, very Kaizen method, like in small incremental load over time and trying to get as much biomotor, biomechanic, bioenergetic development with very simple, intuitive, logical things that the athletes walk in and go, I know what I need to do. I just need to do it at a high level. Just strip away the nuance and just say work and work really hard. And that's been proven time and time again to be wildly effective versus a very, very, very nuanced approach of, I just found out Corey's very fast switch and he has a high training age and he does really well with intensification blocks. So I'm going to pick the sweet spot of three weeks or getting three micro cycles. And if we look at a micro cycle as the completion of one workout to repeating that workout again, a meso cycle is looking at it going through one micro cycle to completion of that said micro cycle. So we now go to a new micro cycle format and that could either through exercises or variables. And all that being said is it really gets down to the, this quality that we're trying to develop from that, that micro cycle has to matter relatively speaking to the greater greater goal. And if that doesn't have any development from one week to the next, or we don't squeeze out as much from those actual exercises, sets, reps, intensity, time and attention as we possibly can, then we're really not viewing this in the right way. The exercises are conduits, the variables we put onto that are amplifiers of that exercise. If that conduit amplification doesn't really get what we want. We misgui we're misguided with the thought process of our training that each step along the way is a fractal relationship to an outcome based off of underlying problems that we did. And that's why it's so important that we get this baseline information. And if we're just not gathering information and we're not understanding the assignment, we're going to miss out on probably the most important factor of training is problem solving and getting to an outcome repeatedly and consistently, because that's what we're paid to do. That if I bring my car to the auto body shop and they say, I don't know what's wrong with it. I'm just going to do random stuff on it. It's not better. I'm going to feel ripped off. And the same thing with training. If I'm not taking any inventory what's wrong and I'm not fixing anything that was a problem, that is, that in effect is a huge issue with not really understanding your job. And yes, I might have an opinion. I might have an agenda. I might have things that I like to do. Show me your weight room. I'll show you your philosophy. I have bars, racks, dumbbells, kettlebells, like very obvious what I'm eventually going to do is just a matter how I organize that and how I layer that so I can get you the best outcome. But I do know my bottlenecks. I do know my shortcomings. I do know the limitations of that style programming and I have to compensate for that in some way to get to an outcome more, more consistently and as expedited a level as possible without collateral damage. Yeah, that was well said, Tim. I really like the, the towel water analogy. I think I'm going to steal that one with my students. So it's like, you know, they, they just can't, it's, it's on me, obviously. I can't relay the message. That's good. That's, that's really well said. I'm going to have to steal that one. This has been great. Thank you. Big thing, create rules. That's it, man. Keep it simple. Yeah. You're, if you don't have rules, you're probably going to be vulnerable to making bad decisions. And mm -hmm. if you're wondering why you have a job or don't have a job, if you're wondering why someone has something more than you, it's just probably discipline with decision-making and being governed by rules. And 
I mean, if you think about it from a, a theology perspective, like all the 10 commandments are just rules of conduct to not make other people's lives worse and have the most purposeful and meaningful life. And I don't think you can say that there's 10 commandments to training, but there's definitely a, if we do this and we have some sort of accountability and standards and some sort of constraints on us and decision-making, we're probably going to be able to get to an outcome more consistently and in a more rapid manner than if we didn't. So having that in place and just going through that. And those are one thing I would like to say are rules. Rules are context dependent. Yeah. They're not universal. So the rules for me in my weight room, they don't have to apply. And quite frankly, if you're not going through the inventory of what you need, you probably just need to reevaluate that. And they should have some sort of connection to your overall philosophy and it should have some sort of interaction with the problems or the bottlenecks that you're create or facing every single day as a coach. And if they, they do, you can refine and improve your rules. If they don't, those rules are just things on a wall that people just kind of look at and say, I guess that's something we should be striving to do. I just don't know how it connects to what we're doing here. Yeah. All right. That's the mic drop moment. Oh yeah. See you, Tim.